lift him up. And now he is our God. He's the one that we pray to. He's the one that answers our prayer. And uh, I just want to continue to let you know and encourage you. Yes. Stay close to the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Especially now. Yes, sir. Stay close. And we're going to be talking about that a lot of it here in this um, here in this uh, sermon today. Um, very, very important. We're so close to that time. Yes, Give me return of Jesus yes, Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. When I say close, I'm not talking about you know, five minutes or ten minutes. And then it, it may be 20, 30 years down the road. But I'm here to tell you, 20 or 30 years goes by quick. Yes, it goes. Yes, it goes. Whatever it is. And I keep thinking to myself, you know, even if it goes as long as, as when pastor's laying on his deathbed, it's okay. I'll be ready to go when that time comes. Amen. Yes, and that all comes very fast, too. My own mother and father, when they were here, it just seemed like yesterday. Neither one of them are here now. But that's okay, you know, because when it's our turn, I'll tell you what, if it's your turn and you call me, I'll be right there with you. Okay? I'll come and I'll hold your hand, I'll encourage you, I'll pray, give you a good send off. Amen? You know, some of you remember I wasn't here last week. Uh, it was my wife and I's 23rd wedding anniversary. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's always important if you got a relationship with somebody, the thing that gets us through is that we have a sense of humor. My wife and I are always constantly laughing and joking with each other. I told my wife, I said, honey, so what do you want for your anniversary? And she looked at me, she says, I want a gun and an alibi. <laughs> she wants a gun and an alibi. Oh, man. oh Lord, that person. Do you know what? We both laugh about stuff like that. But uh, if you hear that I got shot, you know who did it. <laughs> Amen. What we're going to talk about today, the name of this sermon is called A Lifestyle Worth Dying For. Wow. That's heavy. Come on. That's a profound title for this sermon. We need to understand that this is what we live for. We live to have that kind of lifestyle, one that's worth dying for. And we need to understand that that's the kind of lifestyle that Jesus had when he was here. And so we're going to go into detail about all that. But before we go, before we do that, let's open up with prayer. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and thank you so much for getting us up and bringing us down here this morning, Lord, so that we can lift our hands and our voices, Lord, as we worship you. Lord, be with us today. Let your Holy Spirit touch each and every heart that's out here on, in the congregation sitting here and about to receive this message. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let this message enter into our minds and our hearts and encourage us. Yes, Lord. Strengthening us. Yes, Lord. Helping us to grow, Lord, and to become more and more the way that you want us to be. Yes, Lord. Because that's what this whole thing is about. Yes, Lord. Changing us. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank yes, you so Lord. much. Let your Holy Spirit rest upon me also, Lord. Yes. That you would strengthen me and empower me, Lord. Let every word that I speak be your words, yes, Lord. not my own. Yes, Lord. And let everybody in here receive it in such a way. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, thank you so much. Lord. We love you and we praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. A lifestyle worth dying for. You know, many times we've been living our lives in such a way that it was just the way that we wanted to. It's just what our flesh wanted to do. We had boyfriends and girlfriends and all this stuff. And, you know, in this country here, man, you know, ever since the 60s, when they had free love, 
That's what everybody's been engaging in ever since. Then. Yeah, free love is the most expensive kind of love. Yeah. You see, so, you know, we need to understand. And what we're going to go on is that go over today is that that stuff needs to change. If that's still with you today, we need to change that. Because we want to walk with the way that Jesus wants us to walk. The funny thing about it is that I talk to people every day. You know, a pastor has to drive for Uber right now because um, our funds in the church are so gone. We don't have anything. We're a very poor church. And so I don't, uh, I, I, can't, I can't support my family by what I get here at the church. So I, I drive for Uber. I do what you got to do, right? Yeah. So when I get people in the car, in my van, I turn around and I talk to them. I, you know what I tell them about? Jesus. I tell them about Jesus. I bring Jesus wherever I go. And I always tell them. But you know what I've noticed? And, and, and if, you ever, if you're one of the types that always talks to people about Jesus, you will find out that most people out there don't have an idea at all about what the Bible says about certain things. They're not students of the Bible. They don't look. They don't study it. And I'm going to tell you something. If you want to know who God is and what He's all about, and you want to know about salvation and all that stuff, you must read your Bible. Yes, Because that's where it gives you. You want to know who Jesus is and what He's all about? You must read your Bible. And you got to tell people that. I told one guy yesterday, I told him, I said, you know, not yesterday, Friday. I told him, I said, you know, Jesus tells us in uh, Matthew 10, 10 chapter, he says, Jesus says to himself, he says, I did not come to bring peace, but, but a sword. Yes, right. he, he came to divide. Yes, Lord. Now, this guy in the back seat, he went, oh, no, that can't be right. Uh -uh. You know, see, because what? He's got this, this reasoning and this belief that Jesus is nothing except about peace and love and all that stuff. And he is. He is about peace and love. But it doesn't come to everybody. Not, it only comes to those who belong to Him. And that's what being born again is all about. You must be born again. Why? Because that's what makes you part of His family. And that peace and love and all that stuff, that is for His family. Because the other ones who reject Him, I can see Jesus now. Not really. But, you know, he's, gonna, he's going to reject them on that time. Though, because they're rejecting him now. So we need to understand. So when people come to find out and you share with them what Jesus really is all about and who he is, it's hard for them to accept. It's hard for them to accept. And it's why? Because they don't read their Bibles. And so what we're talking about today is that if you recall, and I've been speaking about this on and off for uh, many, many months now. We talked about the confidence that we all should have in the Word of God. What does that mean? That means that when you read it in the Bible, you can put your full trust and believe in it. Because it is the written Word of God. Amen? So you need to understand it. What it also means is that, ladies and gentlemen, you got to open up the book. If you want to really, really get the contents out of it and really, really uh, grow and do well by reading it, you need to open up that book every morning before you step out your door. Because the Word of God will get you ready. It will strengthen you. It will equip you to deal with every problem and issue that you got out here. I said, well, what if the police pull me over and he wants to shoot me? Let me tell you something. You know what? Every time I've had somebody that wanted to do damage to me, all I did was just lift up Jesus' name. I tell him, you know what? I love Jesus. I said, you, what you going to do? You going to shoot me and open up the door for me to go to him? You know, but I tell him, I said, you know, I just treat them with the love of Jesus. And every time it has delivered me. Every time. So we need to understand. We need to put our trust in the Word of God. We also talked about in the past what it meant to have a working knowledge of the Word of God. When you share what you know and what you remember about the Word of God to people that don't know, many times you blow their minds. Yes, sir. You blow their minds because they don't realize. Most 
people live on what they've heard. Yeah. You know, all I hear, you know, God, God bless those who bless themselves. That's not in the Bible. Where did you get that from? Some dude just sitting over there grabbing up everything. God bless me, because you know, I'm getting mine. You know, you gotta understand. You know, that's not in the Bible. People don't know. They sit there and they they, they, they try to think that things that are being said come out of the Word of God. And that's not where they're coming from. They're coming out of the heart and mind of man who is, if he's in the flesh, is coming straight from Satan. So we need to understand that's not the way it is. It's not, you know, so we need to understand that we get that from the Word of God. So this week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we are to live an obedient lifestyle as we abide in the Word of God. Amen. Obedient lifestyle. Now, you know, I want you guys to know something. Church, Bible studies, Sunday schools, Sunday preaching, all of this has to do with helping you abide in Jesus. Yes, sir. That's what it's all about. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. And we're going to be discussing that in John 15. That's why I wanted to talk to you from the title of this sermon, A Lifestyle Worth Dying For. Turn your Bibles to James 1. We're going to read 19 through 27. Let's all please stand for the reading of the Word of God. I'm going to ask Gary to come on up here with his deep voice <laughs> and to read that with you. Chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers, and delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks of himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceive his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distresses and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Amen. You know, James couldn't have put it any more clearer. That's right. That could not have been done any clearer. So ladies and gentlemen, you know, after we, in the past, we've discussed the Bible and how important it is to get to know your Bible. If you notice, this pastor is always telling you, get to know your Bible. Open up the Bible. Read your Bible. Listen, I don't mind, you know, just like Paul, he was always teaching and preaching the same kind of thing. I'm always teaching and trying to encourage you, open up that Bible. That is where your strength is. That is where your power is. When you read it, it literally comes into your soul and strengthens you, changes you. Amen? The Bible has the power to make you into a new man and a new woman as you, as you engulf yourself in it. It'll change you. It only seems natural, ladies and gentlemen, to put things in proper perspective and discuss how we can use that information to embellish a lifestyle that will be pleasing to God. Yes, Lord. After all, what good does it do us if we just lightly skim over these rich words of wisdom found in the Bible and the book of James and never let them stick in our minds to the point of making a change? If you look at yourself, and listen, you know, I love the way James puts it. It's like if you look in a mirror and you see yourself. 
you know and you recognize who you are, but then as soon as you turn around and leave, you forget what you're all about. Why does that happen? You look in the mirror and you say, well, I brushed my teeth and yeah, I'm good there. And I combed my hair and I trimmed up my beard. I did all that stuff, you know, I combed my, I'm good. Then turn around and forget what you look like. Just forget. You see, and it's like that. If we don't abide in the Word of God, that's what we do. We turn away and we forget. I don't know about you, but I like, I like to really look at myself and see what I'm all about. Sometimes I don't like what I see. You know? Yeah. And I know that if you, if you love Jesus and you're up in here, same thing happens to you. You look in the mirror and you remember, man, I did this. You remember these things. You know what you did. And it just bothers you and it bumps you out, you know, and, and that's, that's what happens. See, think about it. Look at the way that we are made. We're able to reason and make decisions. God has made us in such a way that we are able to read His Word and see where we are in contrast to it. When I read the Bible and, and, I, and I'm listening to what James says, I'm, in, I'm looking at all of that and I'm comparing it to what I'm all about. Am I, am I okay here? Am I okay there? Oops, I ain't okay there. Yes, you know, and then we need to, and then when you find something, you hear something that is not right, you need to confess it to God. Yes, and tell the Lord, you know, Lord, I was, we was reading James and, I, and, and he read this and, and it just convicted me. The Holy Spirit just slapped me right upside the head. That's you, Tony. Yes, See, we need to understand and ask God, help me. Yes. Help me, Lord. Get rid of that. Help me to straighten that out. We need His help. He leads us to repentance by His grace and, his, and empowers us to make a change that aligns ourselves with His will. That's what He does. He, that's what His thing is. He's, the Holy Spirit is here to convict you of sin. Yes, it is. And when you get convicted of sin, I'm going to tell you right now, it don't feel good. Look no, guys, somebody just took that paddle with all the holes in it and just gave me a big swat. Yeah. To straighten me out, to bring my attention to something that I did. It happens to me all the time. But you know what? That's what's so wonderful about belonging to Jesus. You might get disciplined, but if you ain't disciplined, you don't belong to Him. Amen? And I know that no matter what, that when Pastor Tony drops dead, I know where I'm going. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't bother me a bit. I don't care nothing about that. This life is only good for me if I'm being a good husband and standing before this church, preaching and teaching and helping y'all when you have problems and trouble. Amen? Amen? That's the only way that this life is any good to me. And when my time is done, I'm ready to go. Yes, it is. You know, I'm ready to go. So you want to keep yourself prayed up. You want to keep yourself locked in, doing what it is that God wants you to do to keep it all straight. Amen? Amen. So now, just for an example, look at Jesus. His entire life was representative of a life that was always seeking the will of his Father. Always. Now, this is the way that we should be. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I know what some of you are thinking, yeah, but I hate Jesus. Yeah. And I can't do it like him. Listen, you can do it like him. You can do it like him. It's like whatever you're doing, just take what you got to do is take Jesus with you. Yes, sir. It don't matter where you go. Yes, sir. I take Jesus wherever I go. Everywhere. Everywhere. And he's always on my mind. He's always there. Yeah. And it doesn't matter when I'm talking to people and this and that, he always is there. Yeah. And I try to follow what it is that he's got for me and what he's saying to me and, and, and doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. And the thing about that is when I do that, I know that I'm okay. All right. I know that I'm okay. Amen? Amen. John 3, 34 says, my, this is what Jesus, when he was always looking to see what God wanted, he told some of his disciples, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Is that what you want? Listen, you know what my work is? My work is to pastor this church. Yes, sir. Yes. My work is to look over this church yes, the best that I can. Yes, sir. Nothing will ever get in my way. Not lack of money, not lack of this, not lack of that. I don't care. Health problems, I don't care. Yes. My job is to do what God wants me to do. Yes. And to watch over you. Yes. To help you. Yes. Amen? Because yes. you guys don't know, but I love you. Yes, we know. Yes. <laughs> 
I love you. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that you're okay. Yes, Lord. John 6.38, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. At every point, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus' life was an example of how to pursue the will of God. Not in chase of his own desires. Yes, right. That wasn't what it was about. We need to understand. We need to be careful. If we start chasing our own desires, have those taken the place of what it is that you should be thinking about? Right. Have those desires and what it is that you want for your flesh, has that taken the place of your prayer life and what it is that God wants you to do? Because I'm going to tell you something. He doesn't want you to chase that almighty dollar. He don't want you to chase a new dining room set. He don't want you to chase nothing. Nothing but Him. And He loves to be pursued by you. And so that's what He wants. He doesn't want you to do anything else. Okay? He wants you to, to look to do the will of God. Not in chase of His own. Because Jesus, He was never in chase of His own desires. But He was always in obedience. He did he did follow what it was that God wanted him to do. Now, what does that mean to always follow the will of the Father? Does that mean that we walk, walk around all day long feeling heavenly, feeling so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good? Is that, because there's a lot of Christians around like that. You know, you gotta be careful of the ones, because there's ones who walk around. Yes, sir. And they'll tell you in a minute that ain't Christian. <laughs> Shouldn't do that. Yeah, see there. See, you listen. God already knows where you are and who you are. He knew. He knew when you came to. Him. And if you're anything like me, and let me tell you something. If you got people out there that you've been encouraging to come to Jesus, and they keep telling you stuff like. Well, as soon as I stop smoking these cigarettes. So, I'll tell you, I hear it all the time. Listen, Jesus don't want you to come to him when you finish smoking cigarettes. But first of all, if you try to quit smoking cigarettes in your own power, it ain't going to happen. You are not able. You are not capable to even that. Yeah, they got all kinds of tricks in the trade. You know, to chew this gum, you know, and all this other stuff that you can do to get the nicotine that your body craves. You really want to stop something? You come to Jesus just the way you are. That's right. Just the way you are. And let me tell you something. When I came to Jesus, man, was I a filthy mess. Yes, I was. Had every sin in the world clinging to me. The only other one that had more sin clinging to him than me was Jesus when he was on the cross. He was on his man. I'm telling you, I was messed up. Yes, I was. Doing all kinds of stuff. But let me tell you, why is it important for you to come the way that he wants, the, the way that you are? Because when he enters you, he's the one that begins to clean you from the inside out. Amen? He's the one that brings the change. Listen, when he came into my life, before he came into my life, I did not like little babies. I did not like animals. I did not like anything. I just, you know, the only thing I liked was a crack pipe, a cold old English 800. <laughs> and that, that, that's what I liked. But it was the strangest thing in the world. It's one of the reasons why I know that Jesus and I are together. As soon as he entered me, he changed me. I love babies. Yes, I do. I love babies so much. My wife will tell you. Because why? They're so pure. Yes. They're so pure. Their little hearts don't know anything about sin. And, and it's like I, I just gravitate to them. I just want to hold them because the things that come out of their mouths, other than throw up, <laughs> it's just beautiful. And you can listen to what they have to say because it comes out of a heart that's pure. Even when they lie. <laughs> you know, even when they lie. And you teach them not to lie. But it's a wonderful thing. God is the one that makes those changes in you. Amen? We got to remember that. Think about it. When we look at the way that we're made. All of these things change us. The way that we're made, we, we begin to take in 
when you read the word, you know, you listen to what Jesus is telling you, you let it sit in your mind and it become a part of you. And that is what will change you. Yes, sir. That's what the power of the word is. The power of Jesus Christ Amen. and written word that is in you. Yes, Lord. So, at every point, Jesus' life was an example of how to pursue the will of God. Now, what does it mean that always follows the will of the Father? We talked about that a second ago. We don't walk around all holier than thou. That's not the way that you want to get in, get to anybody. Because the first thing you think they ain't going to recognize what, who you are. You come around walking around trying to be holier than thou. People are going to recognize that and they ain't going to go with it. You know, in fact, it's kind of distasteful. You know, you think that you're all that. You know, the first thing that a person that knows what's up, they're going to look at you and go, <laughs> And then the next thing you know, they're going to be looking at you to find out what you've been doing. Because I don't care what anybody says. None of us have arrived. No, we are. Okay? We haven't arrived. No, we haven't. You, you, you want to get in my background? You, you might find something that ain't cool. You know? But I ain't going to tell you what it is. <laughs> no. my, my wife knows what it is. No, she knows all about me. But I'm going to tell you something. All the things that ain't right with me, I'm battling with them. I'm battling with them because I don't accept them. And I want to walk with Jesus. Amen? Amen. The best that I can. So each and every one of us got those issues in one way or another. Every last one of them. Amen. Pursuing the will of God, it does not mean that you have to walk around being all pious. And carrying your Bible wherever you go. Singing, my father can beat your father at Domino. <laughs> no. That ain't what it's about. Amen. That's not what it's about. He wants you to be obedient to what the Word of God has taught you. Let it take root in you, in your thinking, in your heart, and especially out of your words. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you want to know if, if the Bible is making any changes, check out the way you talk. Look in the mirror. Remember when, when I was talking to my wife, I said, you know, boy, when I was talking to my friend, I said, you're going to see what's happening. You're going to know. And then ask the Lord to help you get done with that stuff, to stop doing it. Amen? Amen. Turn your Bibles to John 15. We're going to read 1 through 8. John 15, 1 through 8. Give me an amen when you're ready. Amen. All right, we're ready. Amen. We can do better than that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> John 14. I'm sorry, excuse me. 15. 1 to 8. Hmm. Interesting. Are you ready? Yes. He says, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, I and the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. I'm going to go over this. I want you to understand what this is saying to you. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me in the, in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Do you get that? Yes. Do you understand what it's saying? Yes, I do. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do That's nothing. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, when I read that, the first time I read that, I kind of got indignant. I mean, I can't do nothing. You, know, no, you can't do nothing. You, can't, you cannot do anything that's worth anything. People need to understand if you're not in Jesus, if you're not in the vine, you're just a dead man walking. Yes, you are. Dead man walking. Dead man walking. Verse 6 says, 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, and whatever you did, whatever you wish, says ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this. And you, I'm sorry, and you hear much. It's hard to see this. Bear. And you bear much. You must bear much fruit. And you must bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Okay. Your eyes are getting old, Pastor Tony. Oh, tell me about it. Uh -huh. <laughs> that little flash sign, I should have brought it up here. Anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand what this is telling us. Things will be, be uh, it says here in verse uh, 15, what is it? 3, it says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. What is that saying? Listen, understand this, because this is, this is one of the most important things about Christianity. You may be struggling with something. You may be struggling with the words that you use out of your mouth. Maybe you're still cussing and carrying on. You might be struggling to get, get rid of that. But what Jesus is telling you is that you're already clean because of the words that he spoke to you. In other words, when you received Christ Jesus in your heart, you are cleansed. And all of your sins that you have a problem with, he's already taken care of them. So you are clean. You are clean no matter what. You're clean because you belong to Him. And you, you're clean while you struggle with the issues and problems that you have. Yeah. God is going to help you get rid of them. You just keep on, keep on praying. Keep on confessing. And asking Him to forgive you. And eventually He's going to give you the victory. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's the way that it is. Amen? Amen. Because of who you are. You belong to Christ. Yes, you are sir. one of His children. Yes, and it ain't what you know. It's who yes, you sir. know. Amen. Yes, this is so important for us to understand. So when we walk through this life. Abiding in Him and becoming effectual doers. And not just hearers of the word. We are pursuing His will. Now the wonderful thing about this. Is that if it takes all. Of the pressure, it takes all of the pressure off of us. It takes all of the pressure off of trying to figure out what He wants you to do. When we walk with Him in obedience, we become effectual tools for God to use for His glory. But He is the one that leads us and guides us. It ain't about us trying to figure out the way, He's the one that does it. Let's remember that Proverbs 69 says that the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Say that, say that. So it doesn't matter what you want to do. It doesn't matter what you think that you need to do. God has already got you. Yes, sir. He's already got you, and he's going to direct your steps and move you right where he wants you to be. Why? To receive what he has for you and to also direct you into what it is that he wants you to do. That's the way it works. And so it takes all the pressure off you. You, I used to say, Lord, you want me to go to college? You want me to do this? You want me to do that? Hey, that ain't what it's about. He don't need you to go to college in order to use you to do. You know what he wants? He wants your heart, a diligent heart that loves you. Amen? And he does all the rest. He makes all the things. We were, we were celebrating Sister Demetra's 10-year uh, uh, anniversary of being here at the church. The woman has been faithful. She comes here. She sings. She does what she wants. And I have watched her grow. I have watched her grow. And she, she has preached messages from this pulpit that I just looked at that and I went, boy, oh boy, that was good. I've watched it happen. And see, but the thing is that she wasn't the one that made it all happen. Jesus was. Jesus was. Jesus directed me to, to open up a spot for her to preach, and that's what she did. She came in, and the Lord spoke through her, and she did a wonderful job. We need to understand, now, you sitting out there, it's your job to hear what's being said here, and let the Lord move you. Let the Lord direct you. And He's going to make it all happen. 
if he, and let me tell you, you want to do something special for the Lord? Tell him. Lord, I want to be used by you. I want to do something special for you. Please direct me. Now, how's he going to direct you? He's going to, first of all, direct you. He's going to direct you by what's going on here in church. He's going to direct you to Bible studies. He wants to see your faithfulness. He wants to see you come and meet with the church in Bible study. Why? So that you can come face to face with him. And how are you going to do that? By reading that word. You're going to study that word. You're going to come face to face with him. And you're going to get to know him. Because that's what he wants. He wants to get to know you too. He wants you to get to know him. It's all about knowing. He wants you to know him. So Jesus is telling us that we need to stay fixed in him. You need to keep your mind fixed in him. And that doesn't mean that you're so fixed in him that you can't do nothing else. No, 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 no. He wants you to be fixed in him because whatever you're doing, you just always have him in your mind. Because yes, things are going to come up. Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to handle this? Because you're going to have dis decisions to make every day. What it is that you want. My brother's looking for a job. Lord, you know, I'm getting ready to go in here interview. What do you want me to say? Would you please take over for me? Because yes, I want to say the right thing. Yes, and as your interview goes and everything, trust in the Lord and he'll help you get to it. Yes, say all the right words. Then you can bring 10% to the church. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, man. I'll teach you about time too. About times. If we're going to do that, be just like Jesus, how do we do that? So when, when we abide, one of the ways that we do this is that when we abide in the true vine. Now we need to abide in the true vine. What does that mean? That means that we come to understand what it means to be a true follower of Christ. We cannot do it with ourselves, just by ourselves. We need to rely on Jesus. He's going to give us, he's going to show us the way. Just love him. The way that you tell him, you've already told him that you love him. Yes, I do. Yeah, if you didn't tell him that you love him, what are you sitting in here for? You know what I'm saying? You know, he knows that you love him. He knows that you care for him. And so what you do is you tell him and you abide in him. All the righteousness that you have in your life that you are performing, it's not from you. It's not from us. We can't do it on our own. It's Christ in us. He's doing it through us. We are vessels that he uses. Amen? Amen. Also, we not only share in the victory that Christ has achieved, but also we share in his sufferings. Yes, we do. Yes, sir. Now, what is that talking about? Turn your Bibles to Psalm 22. We're going to read 1 to 3, then I'm going to jump to 6 to 8, then 11 to 18. So let's see what that's all about. Psalm 22. No, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and we're going to read, first of all, 1 through 3. Word of God says, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of thy groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I, I have no rest. Yet you are holy. Amen. Then we jump over here to six to six and eight, six to eight. And it says, "But I am a worm. I am a worm that, and not a man. I should need a flashlight. And not a man. A reproach of men, and despised by the people. All who see me." Sneer at me. They separate with with their lip with the lip. They wag the head, saying, "Commit yourself to the Lord. Let Him deliver him. Let Him rescue him, because He delights in him." Ladies and gentlemen, we do we not suffer like this too? We do. Oh, yeah, I've told people about Jesus, man, and I've had people that sit there and, and they look at me like. Oh, I want to hear that, man. And they sneer at me and they say things. I had a friend of mine. He was a friend for many, many years. I'd, I'd be, I'd go outside and somebody say, where's Tony going? He probably had time to save somebody. <laughs> and yeah, I was. I was, but he, he's, he's, he was mocking me. 
Yeah, you know, he was mocking me. You know, he's dead now. <laughs> he died. <laughs> but anyway, and then we're going to go ahead and, and slip down here to 11 through 18. Um, Lucy, you got a flashlight, honey? You want me to read it? Yeah, would you read it? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> yes. 18. Uh, yes. It's making it difficult for me to see. What? Do not be far from 22, 11 to 18. Uh, 11 to uh, 18. Do not be far from me, for trouble is neat, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls, bash and encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. When they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Amen. See. So I'm sure that you recognize that what this is was a prophecy of what happened to Jesus. Amen? We share in his sufferings. We share in the things that have gone on in Jesus' life that brought him to the crucifixion. Many of us, as we follow Christ, we share some of that stuff. We are talked about just like this. So, also when we abide in Him, we begin to mature and bear fruit. Why? Because Jesus is pruning us. We're going to talk about that. We mature. We bear fruit. But we can't bear the fruit unless we are abiding in the vine. Listen, you get, a, you get some grapes, you pull them off the vine, that's as fat and juicy and sweet as they're going to get. They're going to get as juicy and sweet. They have to abide in the vine. They have to grow as the vine, as the vine provides them with the nourishment that the grapes need. When we bear fruit, we, He prunes us so that we bear more fruit. Now what does it mean to be pruned? What does that mean? What it means, now if you know anything about, about plants and stuff, if a plant is growing fruit off of one thing and all of a sudden it begins to grow another twig up here, that's taking away from the fruit. It's taking, it's taking nourishment from the vine that it shouldn't get because it ain't going to do nothing. And so what happens is that he prunes, when he's talking about pruning it, many times what he does is they come in and they pinch off these little fresh twigs that are growing out of the vine that are, that are taking and stealing, sapping the strength that the vine has for the fruit. And so that they're pruned by those things being snipped off. In fact, when they take your fingers, and when they were real fresh, they would take it and pinch it, pull it off, just like snip it off. That's where they came up with that with that um, phrase "nipped in the bud." That's where it came from. And so the same thing happens to us when we are showing fruit, when we are growing in Christ, and all of a sudden something comes up and it starts messing with us, you know. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. You read your Bible every morning. Yes, I feel so good. I'm praying to the Lord. Oh, I feel so good. And then you get up, you do your little prayer, you ask God to forgive you. You walk downstairs and homegirl walks by and she says, Hey. <laughs> and gets you thinking. <laughs> See? That's the way it works. That's a, now what's happened? Something has jumped in there and started growing right out of the vine that you're getting your nourishment from. What is growing? That desire, that evil desire, the one that you used to have, that happened all the time, you know. I know, because it was me. I was thinking about it all the time. Every time I looked at a pretty little thing, my mind went to left field. And there I went. I had to, did a lot of work. Did a lot of work to stop that. I had a, my fortune is I had a lovely wife that understood me. That's why she wants that gun and an alibi. <laughs> no, she understood me and she loved me and, and just dealt with me through all of this stuff. Anyway, and I've done a lot, I'm, I'm a lot better. 
one lot better. I don't do it the way that. I don't do it the way you see. But that's how it happens. So what happens is that you get yourself mixed up in a relationship that you know you shouldn't be in. You're doing things that you know you shouldn't do. Now, who do you belong to? You belong to Jesus Christ. But you're still carrying around this defective flesh that always wants to do what it wants to do. It wants to do what it used to do. And so God has to prune you. And so what does he do? He removes whatever that object is that's messing with you. And he removes it. So that your mind is no longer on that. So that the nourishment that's coming up through the vine, when you read your Bible, it takes effect. It, it's in your body, it's in your heart, it's in your mind, and it's changing you to the way that you need to be. So in pruning, timing is also the most important. Why? When the buds or leaves that first begin to grow, or the sinful relationships, whatever, they first start to grow, and their tissue is soft. In other words, that, that first little meeting with that little girl, you know, it's kind of early. You know, you know it ain't supposed to be right. So if this is going to be a problem, so what's that? God is going to prune you. He's going to make sure that that stuff, if, you know, with your, with your uh, approval, of course, He's going to help you to remove that. So that tissue is soft and it can be pinched off, okay, with just the fingers. So that's where we were talking about that nipped in the bud thing. If God can do that to you. He can, he can prune you, but He prunes people, spirit inside you, what it is that you desire, what it is that you want. He changes all of that. He changes it in me, so I know He can change it in you. Amen. Amen? Amen. It reveals where we stand also, ladies and gentlemen, Amen. when we abide in Him. It reveals where we stand. So what does that mean? We get a real good look at ourselves Amen. with painful precision. Painful precision. Let's remember James 1, 23 and 24. It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. It's real easy to look at yourself and just see what the, what the, what the mirror is showing you. Yes, I'm looking, I'm looking okay. You know, you, everything's looking good. But you ain't thinking about what you're doing. You're just thinking about how you're looking. I look, I'm looking okay. And you go on out there, you go through life, man, forgetting all about what kind of person you are. Are you a good person? Are you a person that loves your neighbor? Are you a helpful individual? Or are you out to take whatever you can get? We forget all about that stuff. We go out and we begin to operate the same way that we used to the day before. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no way that we need to live. We need to recognize who we are when you look in the mirror and let God make the changes that He's going to have an undying confidence in the Word of God. Nor to mention, not to mention a clear working knowledge of it. These things are important. You need a clear working knowledge of it. We also need to put that confidence and knowledge into action as we abide in Christ and His Word abides in us. Let me tell you something. If you believe what the Word of God is telling you, then it only makes sense. Abide in Him and get it together. Follow what it's got to say. Do the right thing. And then you can't do nothing but it just give you all the blessings that God has got waiting for you. We're going to hook up out there up in heaven and run around. That's right. you got stuff for us to do. And it becomes the active directional tool that points us to where and how we are to get to our final destination. That's why James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Okay? Deceiving ourselves. So ladies and gentlemen, don't think that just because you come to church each and every Sunday that everything is fine. That's right. Because if you're not putting into action the knowledge and the confidence that you have been receiving from the Word of God, you may just be deceiving yourself. Amen. You know, these sermons, 
when I, when I do these sermons, they beat on my chest. They beat on my chest and they enter my heart. You guys don't know, I may, be, I may be preaching and teaching you, but I'm getting a bunch out of it myself. Amen? And it's, and it's a wonderful thing. Because when I hear it, time and time again, it just makes me square myself away more and more. It makes me square myself away more and more. So think about that. Keep that in mind. If you've been living your life the way that you've been living it, you know that it ain't right. If the things that I've spoken about here today have entered your mind and your heart and has made you understand that you need to make some changes. Then stand up and come forward so that I can pray for you. Thank you. Stand up and come forward. I want to pray for you and help you. Help, help you. To point, point you in the direction of Jesus Christ and help where He is going to step forward and help you. He's going to help you. He's going to make sure everything is okay. Alright? Amen. You belong to Jesus Christ, right? Yes. Yeah. And so if you've been living your life wrong, you've been doing things that you know you shouldn't do, we're going to pray about that right now. We're going to confess it. But let me tell you something. Because you belong to Jesus Christ is what makes it all happen. Amen? Amen. Anybody else out there want to come forward? I'll consider you as coming forward. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, precious Lord, we can't thank you enough, Lord, for everything that you've done. We thank you for bringing us down here this morning, Lord, because we needed to hear this word. And so, Lord, take us by our heart. Fill us up with your spirit, Lord, and lead guide every step that we make. We know that you are the one that's in control of what it is that we do. You're the one that's in control of the changes that are going on in our lives. And Lord, we know that you don't just change us in such a way that, that everything just blows our minds so fast. In some cases, there's some sins that you take from us. But Lord, mostly, it's a walk that we're going to have to walk for the rest of our lives. As we allow you, Lord, to do the changes in our lives that we need. So, Lord, all I can say is have your way with us. Yes, Lord. We belong to you, Lord, and we want everything that you want for us. Forgive each and every one of us, Lord, for anything that we have thought, said, or done that was offensive to you. Change us where we no longer do those things, where we keep our lives straight now. So, Lord, you are an awesome and wonderful God, and I thank you so much for everything. Be with us as we leave this place. Help us, Lord, to keep these things in our minds. And, Lord, if we do sin, help us to drop to our knees immediately, confess it, and ask you to forgive us. We need you to change us. So, thank you, Father, for all that you do. And Lord, if there's anybody in here that has not received Jesus Christ yet, we want to pray for them and ask that they would repeat after me right now. Heavenly Father, forgive me, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness as I confess my sins to you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for allowing me to become part of your heavenly family. Be with me from now on and forevermore. We thank you and we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Good. How about you? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be beginning the Bible study out here in the sanctuary in just a few minutes. My name is Anthony Stallworth, and I'm a senior pastor at Central City Community Church in the Nazarene. We're located at 419 East 6th Street, downtown Los Angeles, on the corner of 6th and San Pedro. We are a church that serves the Skid Row community, so I'm sure that you can imagine that it's difficult for us to support our ministry with the tithes and the offerings. If today's message has helped you, perhaps you would like to come alongside Central City and prayerfully consider helping support this ministry by sending your tax-deductible gift to Central City Community Church, P.O. Box 13273, Los Angeles, California, 
Nanda Bolo Purti.